Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium, bonjour. Alessio. From a desk not occupied by the sand, I. Audrey. Hello everyone from France. And I'm your host, Fen. Uh, today we're going to be talking about, uh, I think, more games than we normally talk about, but uh, in Deep Space D6, <laughs> um, possibly a bit of five parsecs from home, Takenoku, and then a look at role player versus Call to Adventure. But before we get into any of that, we'll start with the standee catch-up. What have you been up to, Alexis? Uh, thank you for asking. I've been uh, recently walking on... I've been... Uh recently working on uh, another podcast uh, that's um, where me and a couple of friends are reading uh, a book series that we read when we were kids and that now reading them as adults they hit a very differently it's those are books called uh, it's a book uh, very differently it's those are books called uh, it's a book uh, it's a book series called Sherub uh, and it's about uh, 12 years old being hired by the, well, uh, forcibly recruited by the British government and forced to basically uh, do the bidding of the state. Uh, but it's all treated as a uh, YA novel and it's, it doesn't, um, it doesn't really treat the, the complete lack of ethic of the thing, but it tries to be uh, serious and greedy at the same time, which makes it very uncomfortable and weird sometimes. Mocking your childhood books. I, I am mocking my childhood books with a couple <laughs> of friends, and it's mostly just uh, us hanging out. But it's been, uh, it's been pretty fun so far, and uh, I've been really happy with the, the last episode okay. that we've done. So I would okay, recommend everyone not... to look up um, the Sherub Ethic Committee on Spotify. Or wherever you listen. French, I listen to it. Oh, it is in English. Yeah. Oh, great. You'd think so, given that uh, Robert Muchamore is English and it's a British yes. set series. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's also done, uh, was it Henderson's Boys and Rock War? Yeah. Right? Yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> he has. Yeah. So well, that's an interesting thing to talk about. Yeah. I can see, I guess as an adult, when you look back on it, you're like, hang on a minute. Yeah. Th- this is kind of child <laughs> abuse <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 not like looking back on on say Red Wall and you go, ooh, wait a minute, what's going on here? No, it's still just a bunch of cute little animals horribly slaughtering everyone, each other, and Basil stag hair, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, first off, I will start to say that Fen is the intruder today with a name that doesn't start with an A. Yeah, that often happens. Yeah. Yes, but even truer today. <laughs> yep, yeah, uh, if you like, I could just be the object. So for this episode, I can be a fen. Hello, I'm a fen. <laughs> <laughs> One of that, many fens. Like... So is a place where people go and get lost and die. Um, <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> the yeah. a fen is like the dash. Everything is working properly now. Uh, so, yeah, what about uh, me? Uh, these last weeks, I've been mostly uh, doing work on Marvel Crisis Protocol, tutorial with a friend, and uh, we are starting to think about rosters, which uh, I have no idea how to do that. I have a few ideas where to start, but I don't know where to go there. Like, you have to put 10 um, characters in your roster, or 9 characters plus an infinity gem, and I have like 3 or 4 characters that I know I want to have, plus an infinity gem, and I have like 3 or 4 characters that I know I want to have, and I don't know how to complete that, but uh, at some point it will come. And uh, when I'm a bit more experienced with it, we will probably make it a topic. And uh, the other thing is that I'm painting these models as well. Uh, the other thing is that I'm painting these models as well. I'm wa- well awa- ahead with Captain Marvel and Iron Man is going to follow very soon. For the really more board games part, not really much lately. Uh, with my boyfriend, we still plan to not only a campaign game, but also you have a one shot uh, setup. So we want to try the one shot setup at some point. And I think that's it for me. Uh, yes. Alessio, what about you? Oh, thanks for asking. For asking. Well, uh, I have been doing mainly the uh, Legends of the Dark uh, these days. I've uh, I- I've played uh, right now Scenario Five, 
I have to do uh, uh, I have to do the town section I have to say it's a bit easy-ish yes everything they say is true even in solo playing <laughs> anyway uh, we'll probably talk about it uh, when when we'll be more when uh, more of us will have played it so um, I'll just keep uh, the judgments for later and uh, Another important thing, uh, last week I checked the Any Awards winners, which are kind of the Oscars for board gaming, I'm told, for role-playing games, actually. And uh, I got in love with Alice is Missing, which is, which is a very, very cool uh, uh, RPG, which plays over text message. It's cool, cool, cool. I, I really want to play it. I ordered the Italian version. It should be due in November. It looks like a lot of fun. So, what about you, Aethan? be due in November. It looks like a lot of fun. So, what about you, Aethan? Hey, well, um, <laughs> I can't talk at all about it, but I've been playing some Sankakushin. Um, oh. Ooh. Yep. Uh, but I can talk about the other game I've played a fair bit, which is... Oh! Yep. Uh, but I can talk about the other game I've played a fair bit, which is Vagrant Song, which is, um, if it isn't on your to-buy list and you like boss battlers, it probably should be. Um, it's from Weird Games. Uh, they sent me a review copy. Nothing else, just, you know, a free review from Weird Games. Uh, they sent me a review copy. Nothing else, just, you know, a free review copy. I'm going to, by the time this comes out, I'll have a written review out with lots of detail. It's a two to four player, but you can play it solo, uh, boss battling game set on a train where you uh, fight against, well, fighting quotes, where you uh, fight against, well, fighting quotes, uh, fight against ghosts, hates, the Southern American name for ghosts, and try and restore their humanity. So they put a lot of spins on it. It's a about 30 hour campaign game. Uh, it's got a unique take on how the AI works. Um, the the dag, dice bag, it uses that. It uses tokens in a bindle, like a nice little checkered bindle. Um, and you draw those out for the AI of the, the hate. But also you can rummage around in there and get items to use or sometimes even pull out events that occur during bag works like an adaptable dice or a card deck where stuff's been taken in and out all the time. And it's very clever. And it's well written, and it's fun, and the characters are all super interesting, and you've got a lot of decisions. So it's pretty weighty without being overburdened on the on the rules. I would... I'm having... Um, and that's Descent, which Alessio just spoke about, uh, Sleeping Gods, and then this. I, I don't know which one I would put as the best game I've played this year, new to me, but one of those three. So Sleeping God, which is going to come on crowdfunding in French in a few days, I think. It will be on... Uh, this uh, Vagrant Song, it's like someone decided to make 30-hour uh, campaigns over the over the Ghost Train section uh, in Final Fantasy VI. <laughs> which is... Uh, wait, wasn't it already 30 hours long? <laughs> I'll take your word for it. I, I've n hours long. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. I, I've, n I've never played the Final Fantasies. Oh my god! I, I, my brother is super into them, which meant that I wasn't. Cl close okay. to the same. I tried a few of them, but never played really long. The, there's a ghost train in uh, Final Fantasy VI, and uh, he, he, the, there's a ghost train in uh, Final Fantasy VI, and uh, he, he, you, be you begin to see ghosts everywhere because that part is boring so hopefully vagrant song is a lot better than that i'll i'd actually uh, want to try it i really, uh, want to try it i think i'll order it uh, i think it's uh, exiting pre-orders now right yep it should be out pre-orders or, or delivering off pre-orders uh, now mine was technically a pre-order copy um and it should be they got they're planning to retail and distribute in europe count on pre-orders uh, i'll just wait for the retail when it ships uh, anyway i did that uh, my 
my, my list for uh, game, games of the year is uh, includes uh, both Descent and Sleeping Gods, but I'd also add Oath. Chronicles of Empire and Exile. Talk about it. Possibly we'll make an episode about it. It's it's very difficult for me to be opinionated about something when I'm actually like really flat and mad on it, and that's my problem with yeah. it. Yeah. Is is it, it? It. I feel like it could be an amazing game with a, an expansion. Uh, it's the same uh, problem I had with opinion. Root. I don't think Core Root is very good. I. Uh, it's the same uh, problem I had with opinion. Root. I don't think Core Root is very good. I think when you add the otters into the mix instead of one of the other factions or even two of them, it gets better. That's just because you really like otters. I like otters, uh, but my favorite faction is the corvids and then the moles. <laughs> but I'll admit the moles are a little bit too powerful. But my favorite faction is the corvids and then the moles. <laughs> but I'll admit the moles are a little bit too powerful. Actually, if you can get rid of cats and uh, wood alliance, uh, every match gets a bit better. No! So they are... No one should get rid of cats, root or yeah. not root. <laughs> Never get rid yeah. of cats. No! P- poor cat player. And the cats have it so hard in that game. Yeah, exactly. Well, I- I'm actually all about cats. Uh, that- that's not the. <laughs> that's not my point. The cats. Universal health care for all. That's what the cats are about. <laughs> okay, I. I give up. <laughs> yeah, I. That. That. I. I just, are not problematic in design, but they could have done with being stronger. Maybe the new root expansion is looking at touching on that. Yeah. Which it is apparently. Um, but I'm. I. I've stopped looking at what's going on with the root Kickstarter, and I'm waiting for it to just arrive. Just like. Hurry up and send me my uh my, my plushy cuddly cat and my board game. E cuddly cat and my board game. I think it's the underworld that just uh uh went, came out in stores in French. Uh, yeah, that that has. We the are Corvids. catching up. Yeah, <laughs> you are. Yeah, that has the Corvids, which are like my favorite faction by a mile. Um, I I love crows. We got mile. Um, I, I love crows. We've got tons of crows around here. We do everything I can to keep them visiting. We've got Bessie the big crow. Um, doesn't get on well with Pam. They they really antagonise each other. So yeah, that's um, that's my favourite expansion. Well, Cor- Corvids play a lot of fun. Yeah, they are... good either, but they are fun. Um, they can win. When I say not good, I just mean they're not straightforward. Um, but ultimately, I think the otters do the most to improve the game because they do everything the vagabond's supposed to do. But actually do it because they're rewarded for interacting with other players. Whereas the vagabond, I'm not going to interact with you. No, no, I do better if I don't. I... This is worse. Oh, oh the, the, because... their op- the alliance is frustrating as heck, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the alliance doesn't care about what you do. They can win alone. It's not important player count. It's not important anything. Uh, you you can always win with alliance, uh, one way or another. Yeah, I, I found it when the alliance Woodland Alliance is involved. If the game, like if people don't rush to try and finish the game as soon as possible, it's they just have inevitability on their side. Um, well, we're not here to talk about Root again, though. Uh, we're here to talk about a bunch <laughs> of other games. So we're going to go far, far away from the little woodland where these uh, cute little animals slaughter each other, off into the. Uh, outreaches of the outer limits of the void so alexis is going to talk and i cannot wait for the spacefaring ex- uh, expansion of woot hey hey you just pronounced that woot i love that Woot. <laughs> woot. <laughs> um so today i'm going to talk about deep, deep space d6 uh it's a solo dice walker placement game and the best way to describe it your game ftl um that I'm going to guess that most people at least know about it. I don't. Oh, okay. So you play as a ship with a crew made out of dice. And every turn you're going to draw uh, event cards that sometimes are going to be combat. Sometimes are just going to be events that draw uh, event cards that sometimes are going to be combat. Sometimes are just going to be events that need uh, specific crew members to to solve, like uh, an uh, infection among the, the the spaceship, among the, the crew, and you need to assign a few medical uh, crew members to clean it, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, the crew, and you need to assign a few medical uh, crew members to clean it, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you roll your dice, and you assign those dice to the area of the ship. So, for example, you're going to assign someone to the shield to block damage, someone to the uh, engineering to repair some of the damage that you took, some uh, to the weapon to damage, that sort of thing. You sometimes have the option to re-roll your dice, but if you roll three alert dice, the 
turn is over and you need to draw a new enemy card. It's a very fun and pocket-sized game, and uh, it's something that I mentioned quite a few times, but I really like a game that you that has a, as a book. Uh, this one is extremely easy to transport. Uh, I can hold it in one hand. It's very nice. It only has six dice, uh, I think a couple of hundred tiny-sized cards, uh, and the, the ship board. Uh, the game comes with four different ships, and every ship has different mechanics. So one of the ships is very very straightforward. One of the, them is more weapon-oriented, so you have to manage your shield uh, a bit differently. Another one has drones uh, instead of um, normal crew members, so you send your dice up to the enemies rather than, than putting them on your board. It's kind of different and it's some replayability, which I think is pretty fun. The game first was a Kickstarter uh, a few years ago and they've published uh, two expansions since then. One of them just had a lot of enemy t types and uh, an end bust that consists of a uh, few cards coming together to form a big ship that then together to form a big ship that then you have to fight but it also gives you some tech cards to upgrade your ship. So uh, kind of little upgrades that uh, will boost your damage or your resilience or change the way that your one of your station works. It's pretty fun. Uh, and the second expansion, I've only tried it the way that your one of your station works. It's pretty fun. Uh, and the second expansion, I've only tried it once, but they uh, just completed um, a Kickstarter on it. It, it, they just completed it. It doesn't matter though, because it's a free PDF that they plan to turn into a fully grown and to turn into a fully grown book that's uh, properly printed with new die and a few different missions. But right now you can just grab the, the free PDF and um, if you have the, the base game, you can play it. And it's sort of a... Um, Choose your own adventure text uh, rules of the game. So it's a more uh, role-playing adventure version of this base uh, solo game. And uh, it's it's just a tiny game, but I like it a lot. I think it has a lot of um, a lot of charm. And as far as solo game go, uh, this for now um, solo game when I when I just need to to spend the time or. Uh, I'm traveling and I, I know that I'll have a idle hand at some point and I'm not sure I'll have a Wi-Fi and nah, I, I just want to play a game. I, I'll just grab that and uh, know that I can have fun with it. It's just good to unplug the thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, th this is Deep Space D6 Armada, yes? Um, is that correct? Uh, it is the Deep D1. Space D6. I'm not sure what Armada is. Armada is a 2021 one to four player cooperative that can also be played solo. So that might be what you're talking about. Oh, I didn't know that. They... Huh. The the original uh, Deep Space D6 was actually a print and play. I I kind of uh, I kind of lurked in the contest uh, in BGG. The, the, by the time uh, it went uh, it was uh, suggested i think it was like 2000, 2014 yeah it's been um it's been sometimes oh yeah this is uh armada oh, no armada is coming uh next uh next year actually yeah the, the, they basically since deep space d6 uh, was a lot beloved and well received they first made uh of the print and play with a lot of fixes and stuff i think that you can get the print and play and download it from the file Ooh. section of bgg i think it's version 0 0.66 well something. i will have <laughs> to look into your mad and maybe talk about it when it comes out because that looks amazing yeah please do look yeah. the graphical like upgrades and steps and everything's fantastic oh, i would yeah. just like to briefly say and i, I disappointed you didn't mention the designer of this is a new york based designer and his name is tony go and it's such a great name it's a great name that it's is a true. great name it's a really great name this is his first big success he's done like a few board games before but they've never really caught yeah and it's uh people really like it and i think that as far as solo game this is this is just really nice yeah this game is so cool that it was basically printed out of its own merits because it was a free print and play originally. It's yeah. always nice when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh... Uh, No, no, I just wanted to say a fun fact. Uh, uh, since you, 
you you told about uh, FTL. I wasn't thinking about FTL. Now my mind is blown because it's actually pretty much like it, <laughs> crew and stuff. If there are Zoltans, uh, th- that's my game. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I certainly saw FTL when I was when you said, talked about the different ship shapes, and I looked and I was like, this reminds me of an FTL deck plan, and that is really cool because FTL done right as a board game. Mm. Oh yeah, it, yeah, and FTL is you know, um, gets a lot of its ID from Walker placement stuff. I feel that it it has um, some board game lineage and it's fun to see that uh, used, used into a board game now. As we are fun back, fact. speaking of FTL, what does FTL mean? Uh, fast, faster than faster. light. Yep. Faster yeah. than light. And I think I've heard about it. Uh, faster, faster than light. Yep. Faster yeah. than light. And I think I've heard about this one, but just heard. So the explanation yeah. was still uh, good. Yeah, it's a, Fa- a space co- travel resistance against an evil empire ragtag crew of rocks and whatever else the other crew members are. A ragtag crew of rocks and whatever else the other crew members are. I can't remember humans. Mantis! Oh, the Mantis. Pirates! Yes, the, the terrifying Mantis, which is like, oh, please don't don't let a ship full of Mantis people board me. Oh, no. Yeah, uh, and I think it, FTL had a something recently that brought it back into people's forget what. There was maybe an expansion. Don't forget Zoltans. Or something. They are batteries. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity as well to talk about another solo... Um, space adventure role, uh, space adventure solo game. This one's a bit more involved. Oh, it's on its third edition, and um, it's from Modifius Entertainment. I think they might be the guys who do. Um, what's it called? Uh, Year Zero, maybe. Or may- I'm not sure on that one. Our expert isn't here to uh, that one. Our expert isn't here to. Uh, clarify that or not but anyway it's like a small a5 book of um uh, just just of, just under 200 pages and it is a build as a solo adventure wargaming game it's it's a framework where you build a, it's a framework where you build a small crew of like six people and you go on a bunch of randomly generated missions and you fight tabletop miniature combat against ai like relatively simple AI, but you will land and combat against uh, maybe some cultists or something like that. And it's all all working through it all all working through this book. It's like it's it's very comprehensive. The, the it's got a whole universe in there. There's this um th- this overarching governmental thing called unity. That's like oh, it's like the federation with all of the races together underneath it. But then there's some people who are very skeptical about it. Some people are skeptical about it. Some people are just straight up against it. Um, and uh, it's oof. you can play. You can obviously play humans, but um, there's a, there's just a wide variety of other um, creatures and things. You can have bots, which are quite good, but they don't get any stronger. They don't gain XP. Any stronger, they don't gain XP. Um, you can have, uh, if you really want your um, fur people, you can have the feral, who are wolf-cat-human-ish hybrids. Or there's like the Borg, basically. They're called the Solus. Um, it's... I've I've only had like basically a chance to play this a little bit, play this a little bit, but I I really like the concept. It just goes, hey, do you have some miniatures and terrain um, already because you're a war gamer from whatever? Just grab all of that stuff and here you go. You've got this book, you've got all of that stuff. This is a new way to use it. So if you're like a 40k player, you've got a whole load of models you could just use to all of these different things or infinity, like same again. Um, It has its aesthetic for definite. Um, but it's very light and it's very much kind of put your own stuff in there. You take your crew of four, five or six uh, adventurers. You go on a bunch of different like re- procedurally generated missions. Um, it's like a massive amount of stuff in there. Like and, it's like a role playing game for one person with miniatures combat. And it uses Parsec as a unit of space. It will <laughs> of course. Remarkable. <laughs> Remarkable. It says five parsecs from home, which, you know. Yeah, I, I'll be there in five parsecs. Mm. 
It has, it has already happened. I, I watched the solo movie. It gives an explanation of why Parsec has been used at like kind of time. And uh, I don't like the explanation. So I, I don't want to talk about that. Oh, oh well, yeah. But in this, is, is this is Parsec, you know. Using yeah, his proper as terminology. A yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's, here's the blurb, though. They said it's going to be an easy job. Get in, grab the go- book, goods, and get back out. Yeah, right. Those black dragon mercs up ahead. Time to earn your pay. Just another day out among the stars. And yeah, I, I think it's wonderful. Um, although I really, I need more time to play with it. And I've got a very, it's just Necromunda. So it's been a lot of standing around in uh, Necromunda terrain. Um, I don't have cool spaceships to put a park on a table and battle around and things but yeah for our our wargaming fellows and ladies maybe you want to have a look at this i like it i'm not a wargaming person Skir- skirmishing yeah procedurally generated skirmishing it has actually kind of a big following there's uh, a subreddit called the uh, r5 partex <laughs> That's cool. There's a lot of people uh, creating stuff for this game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a little rabbit hole if you want to go down it because it's so designed to be replayable and they've even done some expansions for it with a bunch of other things. Um, I- I've just dabbled into it. There's also five leagues from Borderlands, which is the fantasy version of this. Um, Whoa. Yeah, super cool. Like, get build your own pool. Like, get build your own little fantasy adventuring group and um like a light rpg adventure war game just get out there for and we've got like, six have... yeah with oh we're, yeah we're leagues instead yeah <laughs> <laughs> no parsecs uh yeah um so that's the other option if you have a better fantasy co parsecs uh yeah um so that's the other option if you have a better fantasy collection which i do um i i've been eyeing this one as well because i just i think it's really cool the way that they've repurposed other miniatures and give you this just hey go have fun and it almost feels like being a little kid and it almost feels like being a little kid playing with your toys again yeah yeah actually it's uh, always a smart idea to have one or two of these games with which recycle miniatures because you can basically play with whatever you have around they they may may not be the the most played or the seize the table the most, but they are cool and they work a lot. I think that Gaslands can be used with uh, miniature cards from ranges. Yes. Yeah, that, 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 that's cool. That's a very smart idea. I 100 percent uh, back it. Yep. Yep. And I just checked. Uh, they Modifius are in people who do Mutant Year Zero, and they do Siege of the Citadel, which I have. I backed in 2016 that Kickstarter, and it finally arrived earlier this year. And it's a thoroughly okay, decent, um, like Hero Quest style uh, game. You know, Descent style, uh, but uh, but with very small squads. So. I haven't had a chance to proper, properly ever talk about it. Um, it's because it's also, it's got a role-playing game basically handed to you, which I wasn't expecting to get. Well, uh, then it's time for now to go to something that I think really is original. We're going to go original. We're going to go um, back in time and we're going to go across Earth uh, to a lovely little place where... Uh, uh, the Emperor of China has uh, offered the Emperor of ja- Japan a giant panda, um, and the Emperor of Japan was not quite prepared for how uh, much hassle this panda is going to cause. From Antoine Boza, which is now considered a classic designer, and Takenoko is now considered a classic game, so it's the classic moment. Uh, Takenoko is a game for two to four players, which will fit kids, not very young kids, but kids. Uh, different kind of objectives by collecting uh, bamboo pieces of different colors there are three colors green yellow and pink or objectives of putting tiles in a certain position depending on their colors which are the same as the bamboo or uh, putting a bamboo of, uh, putting a bamboo of a certain size on a tile with a certain, um, I don't know how these are called in English, uh, in French it's aménagement, uh, when you add a token which says this tile has water or things like that, I don't know how they are called in English. 
and like that. I don't know how they are called in English. And so you will make uh, these objectives, which are each worth a certain amount of points. Irrigated, I think. Yes, but irrigated is one type of uh, management, which is um, work. Um, it yeah, they just call them improvements. Call them improvements. Imp impro Ter improvements. Terraforming. Thank you, improvements. And the, the, the way the game plays is very simple. Each player takes a turn alternatively, and the, a turn of a player is composed of just two phases. The first one is to determine climatic conditions, which doesn't end up to play just a bit without, where you roll a dice. That uh, dice has uh, six sizes, which each decode with a symbol. You can have the sun, the rain, the wind, the storm, clouds, or pick which one you want. And then we all change just a little bit something that happens right now. Uh, the player can have a, an extra action if it's the sun, or you can uh, make a bamboo grows if it's the rain, etc., etc. Or, 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 or the, the panda is terrified and runs away when there's thunder and it's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second phase cute. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second phase of a player turn will be make actions which are two actions and you have five different actions to do. Which is take a tile among three and you pick one. Put an irrigation canal. Put an irrigation canal where you take like these uh, little blue bars and put them uh, on the board or keep it for later. Move the gardener in a straight line wherever you want and the gardener arrives on the tile. When the gardener arrives on the tile, the bamboo tile. When the gardener arrives on the tile, the bamboo grows of one section if it's irrigated and on all the irrigated tiles adjacent. The fourth action is moving the panda in a straight line in which... Takenoko. Takenoko. Ah, uh, it's not written Takenoko on my uh, rule book. Ah, uh, it's not written Takenoko on my uh, rule book, but it's a recent version. They edited it slightly, so maybe that's why. And so you move uh, the I panda in a straight line, and it eats one section of bamboo uh, on the tail where it ends the movement. And the final uh, action possible is to pick an objective card, which will give you... So it's very simple, and any time a player feels... An objective, you can say, oh, I'm scoring that objective, and you put it uh, in front of you, visible by all players, and you just score uh, everything right away. So it, it's a game that feels very simple right away, especially if you are more players. Things can, be, can get a bit hectic, because you will want to do that uh, specific tile uh, combination to score an objective, but then another player will put one tile exactly at the place where you wanted to put your tile, and which that's going to mess up all your uh, possibility to score that tile positioning argue, um, objective. Or you will want to put the panda somewhere to uh, have it uh, eat some bamboo, and another player will move it. So it's it's not really something where you will feel frustrated because you have many things to do thanks to the five actions, but it can be really uh, actions, but it can be really uh, chaotic with uh, four players. Yeah, it's uh, it's got some nice like competing ways that all the different point scoring sit together because uh, the gardener objectives want the bamboo to be a certain height, which complements nicely with the layouts where you want the layouts where you want the layouts together. But then the panda comes in and just like cuts down the heights of bamboo you're trying to grow. And I, I especially love the bam the idea of the panda like food scoring system because when the panda eats the bamboo it goes onto this little panda silhouette on your board and then when you've got the right amount you pull out the card and you take the bamboo off much like bamboo's the, the, the panda's poop and go hmm good green pink and yellow excellent right you can have these points i am very pleased with how you fed my panda it's like it just the whole thing makes me chuckle a bit with um with the aesthetic and everything. I had and done considered guard. poo into that. Thank you for giving me this image. <laughs> but it's, it's multi-colored panda game. poop. It's the cutest it possibly can be. You will see the game with different eyes now. Sadly, yes. Yeah. Well, how how else you inspect when you remove the bamboo tokens from your full panda? That's when the scoring happens. What else is it? 
I did tokens from your full panda. That's when the scoring happens. What else is it? I did not try to equate it to something real at all. And that was fine <laughs> like that. <laughs> you, you don't have to. Don't worry about it. Um, I, I also, I love the um, the bamboo height scoring tiles. Yeah. Uh, especially the, um, the bamboo height scoring tiles. Yeah. Uh, especially the four green, which always catches people when I play off. Uh, four green bamboos um, of exactly three sections each on the plots anywhere. And it's actually really hard to do that, so it's worth lots of points. But Yeah, and also it's number of players, so you don't add too much playtime by adding players. You do add some, of course, but not too much. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um... Nine with two players, eight with three, and seven with four. And the person who completes that last objective first gets a little bonus because the Emperor... When I looked at the game, it looks so good. It, it not only does it look so good, but you open the box and it's got a wonderful bright pink inlay with everything like in its correct spots. Uh, I, I think you have to punch the tiles and put them in, but it all sits snugly in. Uh, so much so that um, I do have to ask Audrey. Uh, you have the chi- do have to ask Audrey. Uh, you have the Chibi's expansion, and I don't. I I do have it, and no, I haven't opened it yet. Oh, you can't you can't tell me whether it fits in in any way. I, I imagine it doesn't. Looking at the spacing, I see here. I don't think it would fit uh, inside. I'm just I'm, I'm going to see here. I don't think it would fit uh, inside. I'm just, I'm just I'm going to have a look then. It's it's not very far. Sure, you have a look while I just talk about the bamboo because the bamboo, um, the sticks of bamboo poo made of bam. No, the the ba- they're not bamboo poo at this point. Bamboo poo poo. They um. <laughs> they're, they're, they're still bamboo. It, they're coloured poo at this point. Bamboo poo poo. They um they they're, they're still bamboo. It, they're coloured. They've got nice little patterns um, painted on each one of like bamboo leaves, and they're made of bamboo. Uh, and you have a bunch of bottoms with a quite a reasonably wide base to make them fairly stable, and then a, a sections that fit on top. A reasonably wide base to make them fairly stable, and then a, a sections that fit on top. So you build up, physically build up pieces of bamboo to represent the bamboo. And it's not often games make this step of thematically connecting the materials. Obviously, Spirit Island does it in a really great way. But here, um, bamboo pieces first. I mean, obviously, you couldn't have the irrigation channels being made of water. And the panda is plastic. Cute, but plastic. Um, But yeah, I really like that touch. So yeah, uh, the the tiles of the Chibi expansion uh, are just slightly too. That's not okay, by but... a lot. I'm pretty sure that someone determined and that doesn't sleeve the cards can make it fit. Okay, uh, but I have one other very important question: How cute is Mrs. Panda? On a scale of what? Uh, let's say on a scale of uh, one to ten, um, and you can also go up to twenty. If even out of ten, I think that's a fair score. Yeah, yeah, she, oh, she's, she's very cute, and she's holding your hands like the cute yeah, position. Oh, I've only just seen the advert, the the um the artwork in the advert. I've I've consistently been unable to get Takenoku chibis, um, except uh, and we were talking about been being unable to get Takenoku chibis, um, except uh, and we were talking about this just before we started recording. Uh, I could get it if I'm willing to buy the giant size version of this game. That's right. If you want to play Takenoku with younger people and not have to worry about the meeting the parts, you can get a bigger version, um, which is about the meeting the parts. You can get a bigger version, um, which is, you know, like a few hundred euros, including the expansion. Uh, but it's got all everything scaled up. That's um, pretty great. It is pretty great. It's not quite garden size, because and, and I don't think it's waterproof the way that uh, too many bones and and I don't think it's waterproof the way that uh, too many bones is. Um, but it's certainly something you could play outside on on the patio um, with with uh, with older kids. Yeah, I I totally agree there. I I totally agree there. I think Takenoku, it's a lovely, light, easy game to get with. It just has a little bit of that, ooh, you, ooh, and that just the, just the right amount of bite to make you make you frustrated, but in a good way. 
think our listeners know by now that I handled uh, frustration very badly, and Takenoko is just working for me. Yeah, it would be, let me translate to euros, it would be uh, about 180 euros for me if I if I purchased the collector's edition. It seems like the uh, the giant edition Miss Panda Chibi's edition is like out of print now. And with the future of Asmodee being who knows what, I mean, are we going to see, are we going to see uh, Takenoko reprinted in this extravagant scale or not? Maybe, but I have uh, the inside of the box, so it's yeah. not really exactly uh, the, the size, but it gives an idea. Yeah, I'm guessing based on the um, separate Takenoku Panda figurine, you can get that this, they're probably about 10 to 13 centimeters tall. Looks like it with that box and those tiles. Oh. Another picture which is even better. It's blurry, sadly, and pixelated, but for size, yep. Because you have the big panda next to the small one. Oh yes, there we go. I was going I thought you were going to compare to the small human in the background, but yes, I see the yes, that is what do you reckon like about 5 times bigger? Anyway, uh yeah, so I think I think if you're looking for something light and fun, I think that's where Takenoku's like that sweet spot it's accessible. Um my sister had my parents play it. So that means it is accessible then, yes? Yeah, I'm not sure my parents understood exactly everything they were doing, but they played it. I'm not sure my parents understood exactly everything they were doing, but they played it. Okay, okay, we are recovering from the commercial now. <laughs> no. I, we're, just, we're just gushing about how cute it is, but aren't all of these just, like, that's what you do when you review. You advertise, but you critically advertise, you know? Do you want, do you want the assessment? If you like pandas, advertise, but you critically advertise, you know? Do you, want, do you want the assessment? If you like pandas, or if you want a game that's light with a little bit of crunch and bite, and you want to recreate the, um, I believe, real-world occurrence of this panda being sent from China to Japan and the mayhem that it caused and all the hijinks, except for the types except for the time where it stole a car and went on a joyride, which doesn't happen, you can get Takenoko. Uh, yeah, well, we're going to um, move on from such a cute little game to the last segment, uh, which is, this is, I call it the character, call it the character building game. There's not many of them. I only own two. If there are more, uh, I would love to hear about them, but... Um, I'm not aware of them. And these are a uh, role player from Thunderworks Games and Brotherwise Games with Call to Adventure. It has also the same stat ranges. Oh, yeah, that's that's exactly what I just said. <laughs> so you're saying that I shouldn't oh! show, So I shouldn't show this game for, to my boyfriend because he's been playing the new Pathfinder video game lately and there is a uh, Character change mechanic where you can change things in your character. And I think he's been spending more time in that. <laughs> Everyone does that. Yeah, if, if you love creating characters uh, or if you're about to start a campaign and you're like, hey, well, let's use roleplay to generate our characters, you, you, you could. So if you don't mind having characters that are a bit like wonkily built and have some issues, which can be a lot of fun. Um, what... Um, what happens at the start of the game is you grab a character and it's a board with like holes cut out of it where there's room for D6s to fit and there's a few spaces to put like an alignment card, a class card, a background card. Um, they're double-sided, so there's a, a male and a female version on each side, which I'd like. Um, and I'd like. Um, and in the case of some of the weird races, you just like you pick which one you like the look of because who knows what gender they are, but they're not telling, and that's fine. Um, and uh, what we've got, uh, what you do is, um, after you've set up, you will, dra you will draft dice. So they'll be laid out, and uh, a number of dice are rolled depending on the number of players. These dice come in different colours, and they're normal D6s. And uh, the, the worst dice will be over on the left, and the best dice will be over on the right, but this also determines your initiative order in the market phase. So, order in the market phase. So, if you are going to pick the worst dice, you get to go first on buying, but you'll get the worst stat. Um, and your objectives are to score as many points as possible. You get points from your, uh, your background by achieving um, 
certain color your uh, your background by achieving um, certain colored dice into certain slots so you might be looking to have a red dice in the first slot of your three dice that make up your strength so just like D&D &D, you, you you roll three dice ultimately at the end of the game you'll have and they can have a you, you, you roll three dice, ultimately, at the end of the game, you'll have, and they can have a value between 3 and 18 for your strength. So the number doesn't matter, but the value does. Then the class cares about the total that you get, and it's looking for certain ranges. So a barbarian might want, like, nice, barbarian might want, like, nice high strength, um, and a wizard will want, like, high intelligence. Uh, also... You're looking at moving your alignment around. You'll be given an alignment card at the start of the game and it'll have optimal scoring positions for you to get. And you can adjust it by moving your alignment in a certain direction. Every class has its own little wrinkles, bonuses with certain dice. And essentially, you just play over uh, a number of rounds until you've filled up all of the slots. And then you score up your character according to the criteria. And that's, that's it in the core game. The really interesting stuff happens when you add where you will fight a monster at the end of the game. Um, it creates a good solo experience, but uh, also it gives the um, gives like everyone working together. You know, you know that you're going to face this monster at the end, and you can fight some monsters along the way. So instead of going to market for a card, you can instead go, "I'm going to fight this monster," and you'll look at the and you'll look at. Uh, a number of things that might give you extra combat dice you roll you check the number you rolled against the totals at the bottom and you get food or x uh, wounds or xp or you might even get bonus um, stuff you can also whenever you defeat these minions take a little peek at uh, what the three uh, like trait like traits that the final boss has so like the kraken might give you bonuses uh, for being very charismatic or having blue dice or something like that so you've got a little bit to kind of focus you in there um so that i, I definitely recommend with role player the the experience by itself with the base experience by itself with the base game is decent but when you add in one of the expansions it's way better um fiends and familiars gives you like dual color dice uh so this was like say black and red but they only go up to a maximum of four so they're more flexible but less powerful um yeah, and uh, it's it's an, uh, it's it's kind of wonderful. You you draft in your dice, you get through to the end, and you can even have a little character sheet to copy down your character to use in the future as a player character or an NPC or something. Um, it's quite crunchy. There's a lot to think because you can actually reshuffle your dice around with some abilities, and also and get skills that will like heal you, which effectively increases a dice by one, and so on and so forth. It's um. It's a lot going on. Uh, you could almost call it a very clever, fancy version of Yahtzee. Yeah, I, I love the idea behind it. Uh, it's like 20-year-old me say the lot of chapter sheets and uh, basically someone went with... Uh, and what if we make a game about making chapter sheets? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's a very nice, very nice idea. <laughs> Smart. Yeah, I... I hadn't heard about it, but uh, I really liked creating a character, which I find is, is very interesting. There's um, I don't know any other board game like that, but there's a few RPGs that have, well, tabletop RPGs that have very in-depth um, character creations that aren't just uh, picking your stats and, and but are actually little game on their own. For example, I remember uh, well, there's obviously, um, I, I think that you can spend a long time uh, creating your character and, and thinking about how they relate to the other members of your group in a heart and, or um, a spire. But, yeah, but yeah, I'm yeah. thinking about, uh, for example, the old um, Cyberpunk 2020, where you had the, I want to say it's the lifeline mix mechanic or something like that where you just rolled on a table and it gave you life events that your character went through and by picking yeah. them you then had to uh sort of how your character grew up to that and they every every choice that you pick every every role that you make will give you some little bonus sometimes a little little defect and all of those culminate in a character that's going to be a lot 
more interesting than you could have made if you just uh, picked a few stats. Uh, probably a character that uh, you wouldn't have made uh, without it. And I think that those are always fun and it's great to have um, a board game that's just about that. Well, more the, more the stat aspect, but I think it's very fun. Well, it does do a little bit of like character building as well, because you um, this is actually a promo card from Cartographer, but you could be a cartographer. And it's like you have a natural gift for understanding your surroundings from a bird's eye view. Your desire to record the unexplored wilds of Nalos drives you to adventure. So that could give you, oh, I'm going to play a character who they're a barbarian cartographer. Like, Ooh, okay. that's, yeah, interesting. you know, <laughs> uh, and classes, uh, sometimes you kind of have to um, wedge things a bit because I don't think most uh, role playing games have an outrider as a class, but that's certainly a ranger type. I mean, uh, characterization here is everything. I, I mean, if you just have. Uh, Drafting dice for a point salad. Uh, drafting dice for a point salad. You had like Sagrada or something like that. Um, the characterization about role player is everything. That, that's really, really. Uh, I repeat myself, but it's smart. It's so smart. It's cool. It's a very nice idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Uh, I repeat myself, but it's smart. It's so smart. It's cool. It's a very nice idea. Yeah. Yeah, um, you're also like building your starting equipment. Uh, you get um, bonuses for collecting sets of the same items. You've got limits to like how many weapons you can have. Like you've only got one of each hand, unless I think so, the barbarian. I think so, the barbarian class, which I keep mentioning, may break that rule and be allowed to hold multiple weapons or extra weapons. Um, let's let's have a look. Let's see if it is the case. Enturian. Night warrior like, fighter. Like, uh, yeah, barbarian may equip up to four hands worth of weapon cards. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> I, I I see it more as like this, like like Conan, but coming in with like double double battle handed axes, you know, one in each, or for some inexplicable reason, four swords, two in each hand. <laughs> That's uh, that double double edged sword. Yeah. And um, the, some of the set collecting stuff is neat because it has the gear is coloured. And if it matches your class color, it's better for you. So there is this situations where you're playing with other people and you're eyeing up and you're going, well, this cleric is white, this cleric at vestments. Do I care about that? But you really care about that. And you pick the dice I want, but I'm going before you. And you pick the dice I want, but I'm going before you in the market order. So I can get a couple of points here and deny you like 10. So there's that that passive aggressive drafting like back and forth that you can have where you just, yeah, you take my dice and I'm going to take your gear. Uh, and uh, I like the dynamic of your, your dynamic of your, you're constantly compromising. If do I take the best dice, but go late in the market or do I take a bad dice? Cause I don't care. And you can even have traits that the reward you've having terrible stats, uh, which is fun. Like you just, I, I can't remember exactly the name of it, but there's one that rewards you for having like stats under five, I believe, in like stats under five, I believe, which is quite hard to do traditionally, but in this game, very possible. So yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful exploration. Um, it's always nice to draw draw nice, exciting coloured dice from a bag, um, and there's a whole bunch of extra varied dice that come in the expansions that come in the expansions as well. My downside on this one. You kind of have to buy an expansion. The core game by itself doesn't really have enough of a bite without the monsters, the minions, and the final bosses. So it's you don't need both of the expansions. Uh, um, and I think of the two, uh, Fiends and Familiars is the one I like a bit more because it gives you the hybrid dice and it gives you a familiar who can hold a few extra dice and they have some special rules and and bonuses there as well so that kind of expands the game a bit more um but they're, they're, they're both designed to they're, they're both designed to fit together um and complement each other so you can get the large box that has everything in it but i, don't, I haven't seen that available for a long time so that's role player but alternatively if you want something more narratively based we got here we got here this you can fit so many stories into this little baby um this is call to adventure from brotherwise games and this is a rune casting card drawing 
version. And it's less about building the character and more about having the adventure along the way. Um, um, at the start of the game, you will draw two origins, two destinies, and two, I think, objectives or something. But they're basically bronze, silver, and gold. And you'll pick which one you want from each category. The destiny tells you what you're trying to get your big points for. Uh, the first eight, which are the runes you get to cast. And then the middle one gives you like a special extra bonus. And these traits are very standard, generic fantasy, strength, charisma, wisdom, intelligence, constitution. I so was you, going you... to say uniqueness, northern talent, but that was in a former episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uniqueness, nerve talent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're we're watching um the the latest UK one right now. Yeah, I I'm supposed to say I'm not because it would be pirated, but actually I'm not because I'm waiting to see to have a few more episode stores. And anyway, <laughs> it's no fun if people spoil stuff for you in that show, because getting angry at the stupid stuff that the judges decide is the best part. Um, yeah. So, call to adventure. <laughs> Let's get back to it. Uh, is is about crafting your hero along the way. You'll do three acts in which you'll draft, which just as long as you meet the requisites or pay the payment, it'll slot into your character, and they tend to give you more dice, uh, more runes. Oh, I apologise, more runes. Then you or you can also do a challenge, which you'll have to achieve a certain number on the runes, and this is where the, the, it comes into its own. Past runes instead of rolling dice. Uh, and effectively, you've got three core runes. Um, they all score one point on one side. Two of them score nothing on the back. And the third one lets you draw like a hero or anti-hero card uh, as like a compensation for rolling nothing. And so you're running, you're trying to do a challenge, you'll get your three core runes. And so you're running, you're trying to do a challenge, you'll get your three core runes. You'll take whatever relevant trait runes you have that match. Um, say it's a charisma and um, uh, intelligence. You might have two charisma, one intelligence. So you'd get to have two charisma runes, one intelligence rune. And they're really nice because you get to have two charisma runes, one intelligence rune. And they're really nice because they'll score two points if you manage to hit their correct symbol. So um, for the for the listener, uh, runes are like little tiles, right? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're basically... Well, they're like um, Scandinavian runes. The, well, they're like... Um, Scandinavian runes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. They're double-sided and have symbols on them. And you'll p scoop up all the ones you've got, you'll give them a shake, which is quite satisfying, and you'll throw them down and they're like a bunch of coins. It's another way to think of it. Only these are very nicely made... Um, it's another way to think of it. Only these are very nicely made... Um, I want to say Bakelite. They're like... They feel really nice. And it comes in this wonderful little tray that's a nice which holds sound. them all yeah the, 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 this is the best part it's so satisfying um and and like uh, for me throwing back to throw dice through a dice tower um but runes actually casting runes feels it's such a nice tactile experience we have a little um dice tray that we just toss them into and uh and see what comes out the whole thing, all of it is gorgeous. Like they've got this lovely inlay, they've made rooked in place, the experience tokens are plastic rubies. Yeah, the the game looks very satisfying to uh handle. Yeah, yeah, it is it is a very tactile experience. Um yeah, so you'll you'll go through your three acts of uh first act, once you've completed and got three cards from the first act, then you're moving on to the set cropping up who are far more difficult to defeat. Um typically if you fail a challenge, you get a bit of XP and the challenge goes away, but adver adversaries stay out there until they're defeated or you give up and face other things and move on. Um the game keeps you moving forward, it keeps rewarding you. It's it's great for that. Uh, for that, uh, at the end of the three acts, you everyone reveals their destiny and you like total up. I will say, found that a bit frustrating. The scoring sheet has one layout for scoring, and the rule book tells you a different process to follow, um, which resulted in a lot of times with us constantly getting lost on our score, getting lost on our scoring. Wow, that that's like the long literary. <laughs> yeah, um, you will score for uh, <clears throat> white diamonds, which are like I th the the good, like 
hero points i forget the name uh, black diamonds which are infamy points if you've been an anti-hero um then diamonds which are infamy points if you've been an anti-hero um then you'll score for experience any which you didn't spend during the game usually you spend experience either to get more traits or to scrub away um, encounters you don't want to have uh, and then hero cards you've played anti-hero cards you've played and story and story icons. Um, story icons are like on printed on the cards. They don't do anything, but at the end of the game, if you get sets of them, they're worth points. Or they might relate to your destiny. And the last thing that kind of clicks in is there's this track, which you move up and down depending on what you do uh, sometimes. Um, or they might not be beneficial for a given thing, but they you play them, they're worth points at the end of the game, they help you. If you're in the negative section, you're an anti-hero and you might be able to play either card or you can only play anti-hero cards. Um, you get down in the bottom section by picking up corruption. And have your chance of giving you a bonus or a chance of like making it harder for you to succeed and corrupting you, which moves you down this chart. If you get too corrupted, you're going to lose points because this is meant to be a story about anti-heroes, not villains. And you've kind of gone over the line, mate, you know, sort it out. Um, it's it, it adds an interesting wrinkle. wrinkle. It's it's typically your it's your choice. You might have a character who wants to toe the line about being really evil. The last game we played, um, my partner was a beggar who was secretly royalty, who trained as a spy, and then slaughtered slaughtered her own family, and went out on an adventure of recruiting a giant criminal network. And meanwhile, my character found a mentor, went to studiously study, sat on top of a mountaintop and meditated and did nothing else. <laughs> and that was that was all I achieved. Literally was like studious. All I achieved literally was like studious, harmonious, enlightened, blessed. And I was like, oh, I'm doing all right. And then at the end of the game, I went and picked up a load of infamy points by fighting an adversary because I was not paying attention. And for me, because I was meant to be a good person with no infamy, that was negative points against me. And I really lost me because I was meant to be a good person with no infamy. That was negative points against me. And I really lost quite hard. <laughs> it's just like right at the end, my character just slips from being this good, pure person by killing a priest, basically. And I was like, oops. So, yeah. Now, the fun thing about the cults. So, yeah. Now, the fun thing about the Call to Adventure is you've got two different base games. You can buy the Call to Adventure generic base game, or if you're a fan of Brandon Sanderson, and who isn't, you can buy the Stormlight Archive version, which is an entirely separate core game. You can buy the Stormlight Archive version, which is an entirely separate core game, uh, and based all around. Uh, Brandon Sanderson Stormlight Archive series. Now, also, you can get an expansion for the original game, which is the Name of the Wind. Ooh. Which, if you <laughs> boo, which, if you <laughs> boo, Ooh. if you're a big fan of Patrick Rothfuss's not finishing series, that is probably never going to finish at this rate. But that adds in as an expansion to the main game and changes a few bits and gives you some nice rewards. If you fail at a challenge, you can do some naming of, um, I think it's naming of the wind or naming of iron or names. Uh, also changes the texture of the core game to make it more like um, the world of the name of the wind, which is nice. I've played with it. It's it's OK. It's it's all right. It doesn't feel complete for some reason. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and I, I'm being a little facetious, but it's true because... It's based on only two out of three books. Um, well, I, I would say that Brandon Sanderson's specialty is, is finishing stuff. Absolutely, he's prolific. Even for others. Anyway, the Stormlight <laughs> Archive is... Um, it, it, there's another benefit to it, which is they've added this cooperative solo experience to the game. And we've tried it. Solo experience to the game. And we've tried it, and... It, it works well as a solo game in the core Call to Adventure, but it doesn't work well as a cooperative game. And the reason is, is you draw an adversary and they have certain traits that you have to achieve to be able to fight them, which means everybody's fighting, which means everybody's fighting against each other, even though it's cooperative, to try and get these traits. Like if you're fighting the Dark Cultist, you need either wisdom or you need a, um, a strength. 
and preferably you have a bit of both but there's only so many times you're going to get these and other people are, uh, might be forced to pick up intelligence or wisdom and they're not very help- intelligence or wisdom and they're not very helpful i don't like these semi cooperative things it's not meant to be semi co-op though it's meant to be fully co-op but it, it ends up yeah yeah it, I'm, that's why i'm saying it doesn't work because the end the enemy at the end it works as a solo game because you're given an adversary and you can focus i'm going to try and make sure i'm the best to beat this particular focus i'm going to try and make sure i'm the best to beat this particular adversary and it's exciting however in call to adventure the stormlight archive the enemy at the end uh, just requires you to use two traits um, so you're more open to build what you need to build along the way. Uh, I haven't had to, because we had a terrible time playing co-op in the uh, core game. Um, but yeah, it is, uh, yeah, to face Odium, you choose two abilities and cast all your runes of that type. And he also has like some quests, you adversary quests. So if you want the co-op experience, get the Brandon Sand. You can still hear the exciting noise. Very exciting, uh, little noise. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So that's what it boils down to: is if if you want the crafted story and the card dra- drafting experience, I, I would say Call to Adventure um, might be the one you want to go for. I think Role Player is a my archive is the best of the co-op experiences, um, but Role Player it, Role Player doesn't really do co-op as well. Um, because you're kind of just playing a solo game, but with more people and more characters, and it feels a bit wishy-washy. So that's that's it. That's my that's my TED talk on washy. So that's that's it. That's my that's my TED talk on on these two games, <laughs> which is actually four games kind of stuffed together. Uh, and yeah, so role player if you want crunchy and you like dice, but rune casting is different. And for that, crunching you like dice, but rune casting is different. And for that, Call to Adventure really should capture imagination. And then you just need to decide, do I like Patrick Rofus? Then I should get the original Call to Adventure. Am I annoyed with Patrick Rofus and I want somebody who can actually finish stuff? Then maybe I should talk to uh, the second Rofus and I want somebody who can actually finish stuff. Then maybe I should talk to uh, the second Robert Jordan. Sorry, <laughs> Um, I'm waiting for the TV show, The Wheel of Time. I am as well. I cannot wait for all that knuckling of beards and wrinkling of brows and straightening of skirts. Um, Which is beards and wrinkling of brows and straightening of skirts. um, And bread tugging. Yes, tugging (laughs) of braids. (laughs) Robert Jordan really had some idioms he went back to over and over, bless him. But I... Oh, I love Matt and Perrin. They're my favourite. They're not mine. But that's well, a for another. Uh, uh, we're not here to talk about books because I gotta say I'm not. I, I'm not a big fan of Wheel of Time. In the end of it, I got fed up and stopped watching. I am gonna try the TV series because I hope. I hope now they can present the more boring parts in a better fashion. But I got tired with it spinning its wheels on stuff. Ha. Huh. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. I go to book three, so can't really comment. I, I, I'm going to say if you stopped at book three, it's understandable because book three really annoyed me, and I almost yeah, <laughs> yeah, I stopped there, and I think the Dragon Reborn, is, uh, uh, like kind of that because it's Italian, so Dragon Rinato. Yeah, the Dragon Reborn. Yeah. Le Dragon yeah. Reincarné. <laughs> yeah, fancy that that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Uh, so we, we shan't get into talking about that. Let, let's all agree that Wheel of Time is way better than the Sword of Truth. If you've not read that, just agree with me. I will yeah, just agree no. with you. Can agree. Can agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I could talk about it at some time in the future, but I don't think we'll ever play a board game based on Sword of Truth. But if you ever want to be aggravated and frustrated and annoyed with a writer who likes to tear the main characters apart, when the whole first book was about how to get together... Uh, in other words, do the same thing over and over, and also support and Rand, uh, you know, yeah, uh, that yeah, kind yeah. of philosophy. Mm, then uh, that's uh, that's a series I I was very happy to put down after a while, not pick up. And to get back to the board games, yes. uh, I, I, I before we decided to talk about uh, Call to Adventure, I did not know that he had a part in that, and I'm always surprised in 
first, how much writing he manages to do, which is one thing, uh, but uh, also how much involvement in writing things uh, he can do, because there is a Reconners uh, board game as well. Uh, I saw it on Kickstarter, I think it was two or three years ago, maybe. Um, and he was involved in that as well, and he... I don't know how he can manage to do that. I don't know how much time he sleeps. I don't know how he can manage to do that. I don't know how much time he sleeps per day, and I don't want to ask. Yeah, I think in the case of this, it's um, it's it based on his works, and you know, he's like looked at it and said, "I approve of this," and has put be willing to put his name on it. The same as Patrick Rofus. That yeah, I, I think he had his a... name on it. The same as Patrick Rofus. That yeah, I, they don't I, I think he had. A... As... A slightly bigger involvement than that, but yeah, not not a lot. But uh, also, like every time he travels, he goes to the bookshops uh, in the airports and steals signs every book of him that he can find. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes on his that airport has uh, books signed from me here, etc. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, he's um he's a treasure, uh, absolutely a treasure. For the, uh, for, uh, you know, exactly how you'd want a, a writer to be, yeah. as opposed to what writers typically are, which is cranky and isolationists. Yeah, I remember at some time he was asking, "Oh, I'm in Paris. Which church should I go to?" Ah. Which one did he, which one did people recommend? I do not remember because it was two or more years ago. But yeah, he he has a lot of involvement with the community as well, and I think that. You can see that uh, with all the extra work that he's doing. Yeah, yeah, he's a, uh, yeah, I, th- I think he's a, definitely a treasure. Um, mm. And maybe that's another reason to go for the Stormlight Archive version, so you can support Brandon Sanderson, who almost certainly gets some kind of cut from every purchase, given that his name's on there. Oh, I for don't sure. Know exactly what? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that you know if uh, if you do happen to know of any others i would be really thrilled to hear about them because i think it's an interesting genre i think it's a new genre and there's definitely room for innovation and also if anyone knows of any other games that use rune casting that are good hit me up because i am <laughs> i'm up for hearing about those because I, I am i'm up for hearing about those because it does just feel really nice to to throw them and they feel l- less frustrating than dice that brings us to what we've got time for. Uh, so with uh, with that, it is all we have time for in this episode. And thank you for listening. Uh, with that, it is all we have time for in this episode. And thank you for listening to The Last Standee. Uh, you can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash The Last Standee or follow us as The Last Standee on Twitter or subscribe on your preferred podcast app. And you can also catch Alexis over at, would you like to once again plug? The Cherith Ethic Committee. Uh, it's on Spotify and wherever you listen to your podcast. And it's goodbye from Alexis. Goodbye from Belgium. Alessio. Bye bye. Audrey. Bye bye. And if you want to see some Marvel Cruises Protocol minis painted, you can catch me on Instagram at millennia with. Dandy is for endings. <laughs>